As Roth describes, this is a man who tries his entire life not to do the wrong thing. And that turns out to be precisely the wrong thing to do. Sometimes it shit just works out. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm your host, Clifford Lee. <laughs> yeah, you all know that. It's raining today. It's raining today. I haven't listened to Scott Walker in forever. That means I've been in a good place in life. Anyways, today, American Pastoral by Philip Roth. Good times. Not really. Philip Roth. Philip Roth. This is my first Philip Roth. This was recommended to me by a, a very kind fan of the show. Uh, fan turned friend. I didn't enjoy reading it. I think it's a great novel, but it is a tremendously depressing book. Philip Roth was born in Newark, New Jersey, and much of his writing takes place there, including American Pastoral. Pastoral or Pastoral? Which one, which one do you say? Pastoral? Pastoral? It's part of a trilogy. Features recurring themes in that trilogy. I've read post-war American society and politics, often in a Jewish context as he's Jewish. He's been extremely successful. He's gotten all sorts of literary prizes. So Roth said, if you read a novel in more than two weeks, you don't read the novel really. Well, in that case, like I totally fucked up. This took me like four months, three or four months or something on and off. I really struggled with it. Uh, I highly recommend you read it. I think it's fantastic. I think it's a wonderful book, but this, so his style, I would have to read it two or three times, these giant paragraphs before I would actually get all of the information. And I must have done that. I must have read this novel actually probably closer to three times, to be honest. Uh, I have this neurotic thing about me where I must get all the information. I really want to get all the information, especially in something like this where it's like so plot driven. Not so much about the, 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 the beautiful prose, although it's very nicely written. It's, it's more about the story and, uh, and what's, what all of the components are that are making this thing work? Or rather, what are all the things being taken away from this man that causes him to collapse? It's like a game of Jenga. A really cruel game of Jenga. You're just taking away these little pieces of a man's foundation, bit by bit. Just breaking them. Although it's not immediately obvious that it's all going to collapse, but of course we know how the game ends. We know how the game is played. So this fellow named Nathan Zuckerman, who is Roth's alter ego, attends this, uh, this Newark high school reunion. And he meets up with this brother of a man named The Swede. A man named Seymour Lavov, who was nicknamed The Swede, who was this star athlete during the war when they were kids. You know, he was a, he was a high school athlete, but he was a, uh, the pride of this neighborhood, you know. The neighborhood needed something positive in their lives. After all, you know, it's the middle of World War II and things are, you know, so something to focus their attention on, and he was the pride and joy of the neighborhood, this, this star athlete. So he always wondered what happened to this guy, you know, it was sort of this hero of his, it seemed. And uh, he meets his brother at this reunion, and some of the things that his brother says are a little bit cryptic, like, you know, like something, he gets the sense that something really bad has happened to the Swede. So Zuckerman meets up with the Swede, they have dinner together, and everything seems fine. Perfectly fine, like it's all just fine. And that's what he's wondering the entire time. Zuckerman is wondering what's going on with this man's life. What's actually happening here? What actually happened to this guy? Uh, because he's impenetrable. He, he just, he's just proud of his kids and he just looks like totally normal. And he gets the sense that he's just playing this role. He's not telling the truth about what happened in his life. He's just, he's just trying to act as normal as he possibly can. There's something there. He thinks, but he's not sure. So later on, the Swede dies. And so Zuckerman imagines what happened to him based on real life events and the information from the Swede's brother. So this is the gist. This is, this is it in a nutshell. The Swede is a very strong man who was completely destroyed by reality. As Roth describes, this is a man who tries his entire life not to do the wrong thing. And that turns out to be precisely the wrong thing to do. 
That's so dope. Swede Lavov is an athletic Jewish kid who inherits his dad's glove manufacturing business in Newark. This takes place in the late 60s, early 70s. Marries a former Miss America contestant and moves out to the countryside, living the American dream. And has one daughter, Mary, who becomes a far left terrorist after becoming obsessed with the Vietnam War and blows up the little post office in town, the little local post office, and kills a man, and then goes into hiding, and he doesn't see her for years. And all of a sudden gets this information that she's actually in Newark, that she's nearby, uh, still hasn't been caught by the police. And he goes to find her, and she's living as a Jain, as in a devotee of this ancient Indian religion, Jainism, where she's afraid to harm anything living, um, including insects or, you know, I mean, plants, like eating plants is like a, a doing harm to the plants. Uh, the entire goal of the Jain is to do as little harm to everything and anything as possible, so much so that the end goal is to just basically starve to death and, and do nothing to harm anything, you know? She's wallowing in a filthy room, living this bizarre, ascetic, half-life of non-violence. She's fucking crazy. She's gone completely insane. Afraid to harm everything, ironically, of course, as she murdered a guy. This is how the Swede finds his daughter, this daughter that he raised perfectly, by, by all rules and, and all metrics, a uh, perfect childhood, it, idyllic, like impossible to get better, never, never treated her badly, did everything he could to help her, was very stable, stayed together with his wife, who was also incredibly supportive, both of them very loving. All of the elements are there. It reminds me like of, uh, of uh, Jeffrey Dahmer's dad, you know? It's completely outrageous. Um, he wasn't exactly the pinnacle of perfection, but I mean, it was, it's, you know, not to, not to merit what his son did. Anyways, uh, so this is how he finds her, starving destined intentionally for death. Spoiler alert, he also discovers that she's been raped twice and has killed, in the time they've been apart, in the time he hasn't seen her, three more people. The book deals with the Swede, this man, her father, trying to keep it together. In a BBC interview, Roth discusses how it's not about why or who is to blame, it's the fact that the violence is senseless, right? That's the terrifying thing to the Swede because his suffering is increased due to the senseless nature of it all. It's the thing he can't take responsibility for and understand. It's out of his hands, out of control. There's a line near the end of the book where it's like he thought that uh, the universe or the world was mostly order and a little bit of disorder, but in fact, it's the exact opposite, you know? That's, I mean, what a, what a life to have to live, right? It's kind of like Job, except there's no God whatsoever. Nobody controlling anything, just chaos. Roth is really mean to his protagonist, I gotta say. Again, it's a challenging read. If just because, you know, you, you have to watch this character sort of like built up and then just like <laughs> uh, destroyed, you know, a, a man who doesn't deserve it at all. You know, so it's, it's not exactly a, a fun. It's a very pessimistic lens. It's not a place I like to spend a lot of time in, but it's a good book. You feel him behind the pages, right? I mean, you, you do feel his pessimism. Uh, <laughs> not even leaking, I was gonna say leaking through. It's, it's not leaking, it's flooding, flooding through. But the book shows how we all connect, how we influence each other, generation through generation. How even the smallest actions have huge emotional or psychological consequences for those connected. Um, and you know, it talks about this, this it, it's this interesting juxtaposition where it's like chaotic random violence, no order or meaning whatsoever, but then also all of this historical meaning and the, the tracing of actions and reactions throughout history. Um, I suppose it's, it doesn't give any answers, right? Maybe that's the depressing thing. I mean, it could be, you know, uh, it just asks a lot of questions, very, very difficult questions. So later on, after all of these events occur, you know, his wife loses it. She's put in a, a psychiatric hospital, I think, and, uh, uh, and then gets a facelift later and try, try, tries to reinvent herself and put together uh, all the pieces. The Swede has this disturbing realization that what he loves is not what his family loves. His wife doesn't love the beautiful house. His daughter doesn't love the trees. She loves Algeria. She loves communism. 
All he ever restrained by his responsibility was himself. Reality is not the same for everyone, but in this case, it's not even close. How does it feel to do everything right for your child, for your wife, and have it all blown up anyways? To sacrifice everything, to be a pillar, a mountain, a kind, decisive, non-violent force of benevolence, and watch your entire world die in an instant. Now that happens to people. That's the disturbing thing about this, right? You know, I was in Austin, Texas when that guy was sending bombs in the mail, uh, killing people very recently. And uh, I think either on the day I left or right after I got back, they caught him. And this young kid who was killing people with male, male bombs. And, uh, uh, and then he blew himself up when the police caught him. It was crazy. It was a strange coincidence of bombers and life coinciding. I don't know. Man, pretty weird. That people were manifold creatures didn't come as a surprise to the Swede, even if it was a bit of a shock to realize it anew when someone let you down. What was astonishing to him was how people seemed to run out of their own being, run out of whatever the stuff was that made them who they were, and, drained of themselves, turn into the sort of people they would once have felt sorry for. It was as though while their lives were rich and full, they were secretly sick of themselves and couldn't wait to dispose of their sanity and their health and all sense of proportion, so as to get down to that other self, the true self, who was a wholly deluded fuck-up. It was as though being in tune with life was an accident that might sometimes befall the fortunate young, but was otherwise something for which human beings lacked any real affinity. How odd, and how odd it made him seem to himself to think that he, who had always felt blessed to be numbered among the countless unembattled normal ones, might, in fact, be the abnormality. A stranger from real life, because of his being so sturdily rooted. Everything dies, we're castles made of sand, things fall apart. It's true. Not denying it. It all perishes. We all perish. All of it. And you can see throughout the novel, you know, he sees the downfall of the glove industry, his father's business, the downfall of the city with the riots in Newark itself. It mirrors the Swedes' downfall. The war in America and the war in Vietnam, it all comes into his house, right? It's all connected. The trajectory, if you haven't got it by now, is down. <laughs> so if, it, if, you know, if, if you don't want to be tremendously depressed, then skip it. I mean, it's fine. Roth's novel is not disturbing because of its extremity, but rather its depth and believability. I've spoiled enough of it, but the ending is simple yet devastating. It's just one single action. It's worth it just for that, you know, the whole build up and brilliantly executed. Very, very well done. You know, hats off to Mr. Roth, but I'm not rereading it, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing here, but Roth said something like, the great invention of fiction is that it invents consciousness. The great invention of fiction is that it invents consciousness. And I think he was talking about the differences in how authors do that, you know, because you have Hemingway doing that and then you have Joyce doing that and you have everybody in between. So Philip Roth invents consciousness in a very idiosyncratic fashion, very wordy, repetitious, a little stream of conscious inner monologue, but not a lot, pretty straightforward narrative, maybe some flashbacks, I think, a lot of history, a lot of comparisons, a lot of metaphor, uh, using the town, the, the setting, Newark, its history, actual events in America, political events, Kennedy, Vietnam War, riots in Newark. The violent history, the chaos of America in the late 60s, early 70s is pervasive in American pastoral. So if you're a fan of Franzen, if you're a fan of uh, DeLillo, uh, definitely the whole family dynamic, the, the, the interior life of all these family members and the downfall, the, the disintegration of the middle class family, plus, you know, American politics and war, sports and history, all of that. Roth is a pessimist, but after reading him, I can say positively, absolutely, that he is courageous totally courageous to confront the things that he does and one ought to be paying attention whether or not one comes to the same conclusions if there are any i don't know if there are any conclusions necessarily in the book i found it interesting that he said despite his success he would not want to be a writer again nor would he want it for a child of his you're always an amateur he says you're alone you're the only person who can make it happen nobody can help you and you have to drag this thing out of you 
I find it very difficult. That's a hell of a lot to put yourself through. You know what I'm saying? That's a hell of a lot to put yourself through. So hats off to Philip Roth. Better than food. Now time for the coffee lottery. Coffee Lottery, for those of you who don't know, is where I take all the names of patrons who have donated $5 or more on Patreon and I place them in this mason jar. I pull out a name, and whoever's name I pull out, they get sent a copy of the book that I'm reviewing and a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. So if you'd like to know more about that, you can follow the link in the description box below and head over to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and uh, donate $5 or more per video and I will place your name in there. You'll have a shot at winning Awesome books, such as American Pastoral. Best of luck to everybody who has donated to the show. Thank you. Ba -ba -da. Come on now. Cameron, thank you so much for your very generous donation, Cameron. Hope you enjoy this book. It's a doozy. And thanks to you, you, you right there, thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed already, if you could do that, I'd really appreciate it. It really helps the show out, you know, more numbers, more eyes, bigger community, more books. You know how it goes. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, all that jazz. A like on Facebook would be greatly appreciated. We can't escape the fact that we are all going to die, but I think Philip Roth would agree with me when I say die reading. Okay, take care everyone. Have a good night. Ciao.